ladies and gentlemen, my name is Eduard Petrovsky, and until the end of this assembly, I am the president of IAGA. The acronym stands for the Association for Geomagnetism and Ironomy. And today, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Lisa Tox. She is a professor and past chair of a department at Scripps Institute of Oceanography at uh, San Diego, or La Jolla, more precisely. And she is one of our top authorities on, uh, on ancient geomagnetic field and applications of paleomagnetism to geological problems. I am not going to talk about her achievements because uh, Uncle Google knows better about her achievements than I do. And it would take me too long to mention all of them and it's impossible to pick only the most important of them. Uh, I know Lisa for quite a long time and I can say that many of our colleagues, several generations can call her their mother or grandmother. Uh, she raised, she educated a lot of successors who are already highly recognized experts all around the world. And Lisa, she was always willing to help, assist and supervise with her experience, with her advice, with her help. And today it's my great pleasure to give the floor to Lisa because she is going to share her knowledge, her expertise with all of us. Thank you very much, Lisa, for accepting the invitation. And please take the floor. Thank you, Ed. Edward. I guess I won't use Ed. <laughs> um, okay. So I'd like to thank the uh, organizing committee and um, um, IAGA for inviting me to give this union lecture. Um, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be able to uh, tell you about what I've been focusing my um, attentions on uh, over the last, I don't know, 30 years. Uh, the title is um, a generic title because I never know what I really want to talk about <laughs> when I give a talk like this. Um, but I'd like to acknowledge, uh, is, there a, is there a, hmm? Oh, never mind. So um, my collaborators on this are uh, Les Nudge, who's a postdoc in my uh, lab, Christian Santos, who's a master's student, Brendan Seish, who's a um, third year, starting to be a third year graduate student, and Wynne Williams, who's my colleague in, um, in um, Edinburgh, who was the father of Les Nudge. Um, so these, these guys, without these guys, this would not be possible. I also want to note that um, um, I'm, I'm dedicating this talk to Neil Updike, who passed away in uh, February, in um, April, and um, I miss him very much. He was my uh, original graduate advisor. So why study the magnetic field, um, or how we can study the magnetic field? I'm assuming most of you know why we would do it. <laughs> uh, um, and the way that we do it is through direct observations with, um, with um, observatories, which are, are like the one that you saw. Um, sometimes they're in very remote places, mm. and, uh, and they're observing the magnetic field all over the world. Um, and then there's also satellite observations uh, from, from the last, um, uh, well, since about the early 80s, uh, there's been intermittent satellite observations, which give us a lot of information about the magnetic field. Um, there's uh, human measurements that go back about 400 years, uh, maybe a little longer, well, since the age of exploration, which are archived in captain's logs, and people have been rescuing those data. Um, my colleagues, uh, um, like Andy Jackson, he might be here, um, and then we can study the magnetic field through numerical stimulations, which um, uh, involve huge computers and huge assumptions and, um, and parameters that we, we can't access because the, field, the generation of the field is too complicated. So these are, are clues as to what the field might do. Um, and we can also generate magnetic fields, or will be someday, in, um, in big uh, um, 
very scary liquid sodium uh, <laughs> um, um, <coughs> twirling globes um, uh, in people's labs. What I do is I use indirect, uh, what I call accidental records, which are geological and archaeological. And um, <coughs> those, uh, uh, I should also point out there's huge archives of un transcribed uh, data from individuals' labs. And my lab is trying to rescue some of the archaeological data, but it's a huge effort, as Ed just uh, explained. Um, <coughs> but uh, what we do with, with these incidental or indirect accidental records is uh, sediments get magnetized when they, when they form. Um, it's a very complicated process and nobody understands it. I've tried for many years. And then there's igneous rocks and, include, and archeological artifacts which get magnetized when they cool from high temperature in the presence of a field. And this is called a thermal remnant magnetization. And that's the basis for studying the past strength and direction of the magnetic field back when people were not making those measurements. I should say it's the, it's the only way we can study the ancient magnetic field because people weren't around a million years ago. Okay, so I was recently at a, at a conference and somebody showed a slide like this of, um, uh, he called it the optimism-pessimism cycle and, uh, and it starts with great optimism and then you end up in this well of pessimism where nothing works and you don't understand anything. And then you creep into this uh, realm of realism. The, the thing that I love about this is that it's um, self-similar. So this describes a process over career. And it's actually my daily experience <laughs> with this field. So um, why should we be optimistic that we can study the ancient magnetic field at all. Um, and I'm going to uh, focus on thermal remnant magnetization right now. Um, and there, there is a physical theory for thermal remnant magnetization, TRM. And that makes us very happy. Uh, the theory is uh, um, simple. Um, if you have a dipole, a little magnet in your rock or your pot, the the it will have several uh, lower energy states where the magnetization will be along one direction or another, and there's an energy barrier in between. This energy barrier is uh, temperature dependent, and so um, you can go from being basically in equilibrium with a field to freezing this in for geological time. And you, from the basic idea that you have this energy barrier, you get a Boltzmann distribution, and from that you can get to a hyperbolic tangent function, which relates the magnetization that you acquire in a particular specimen to the ancient field as a hyperbolic tangent function, which relates it to the temperature and uh, the magnetic field um, that's applied. This, in turn, boils down to a straight line for low fields like the Earth's today. And, um, and all you need to do in principle is, this is the optimistic view, is uh, to just measure the magnetization of a specimen and then um, replace that magnetization with a magnetization that's acquired in a laboratory in a known field. And you just divide the two remanences, multiply by the lab field, and Bob's your uncle, you know the ancient field. That's what the base, the theoretical basis is. So uh, you say, well, that's easy. So um, of course it isn't so easy. We have a, a more um, elaborate experiment than just that single heating test where you replace the magnetization in an incremental fashion um, and, um, and the straight line behavior of this, you, you have the natural remnants decaying as you heat it up to higher temperatures and, and that energy barrier goes down and more and more and you uh, become in equilibrium with a zero field and so the magnetization disappears and then you uh, up give it a magnetization in a known field and that's the induced part 
and, uh, and then you plot the natural remnants versus the induced and you get this nice straight line, right? It's because it's supposed to be a straight line. So there, um, the, the problem is, I mean, what could go wrong, right? Easy. Uh, the hyperbolic tangent is, is not linear. Um, at high fields, it's, it's uh, not linear and it depends on the details of the magnet, magnetic minerals involved and the fields in which they're in. Um, the specimens, well, when you heat things, they change chemically. We're talking about heating things up to 600, 700 degrees centigrade, and you know that's how you make pots, and you make bricks, and they turn red, and they change chemically, and so you no longer are studying the same thing that you started with. And, and uh, so that's something that could go wrong. The Laboratory TRM may not have been acquired by the same mechanism. It may have acquired by cooling more slowly, for example, thousands of years in a pluton versus in your laboratory, which is much quicker on the order of hours. And, uh, and the relationships w from theory will not be the same. Um, also, the, the, little, the distribution of the little crystals in the rock may not be isotropic, so you have an anisotropy problem. And the, the rocks may have been hanging around for a long time, may have been reheated. You might be dealing with a hearth, for example, in archaeological materials, and somebody came along and reused it. And um, so you might not have a simple, single magnetization event, and uh, that makes things more complicated. So experiments like the one I just showed you have been going on since the 30s. Um, and that theory that I showed you came from 1949 originally, and so people started optimistically with no physical theory and started doing these, this work. Then everybody was relieved to find that there was a physical theory, and so um, we've been doing it ever since. There's a large amount of data in uh, databases. In particular, I'm thinking of the magic database and there's, there's, it's been ar archived summary data like the field intensity predicted, not all the measurement data have, have been um, archived. A almost all the published data are available in this derived form. And I'll come back to why I think we need the actual measurements um, at the end. So we take, we, g we go look at all the data that have been published for the last, since 1936, um, and going back to 3.5 billion years. Um, and uh, the little, the, the y-axis is something we call the virtual axial dipole moment, which is the magnetization of a fictitious hypothetical little bar magnet at the center of the Earth, giving rise to the field which is observed. And you can see the present day field is a, about uh, 80 zeta amp meters squared. And it changes a lot. Um, it, it, some of these dots, I know my colleagues are saying 350, dude. Uh, so uh, how reliable are these data? Um, do they mean anything? How do we know? They're just, a, it's just a data point in a, in a database. So we need to somehow ground truth these data. The dipole hypothesis, the, f the hypothesis dating from 1600 that there's this fictitious little dipole in the, the center of the earth. Um, William Gilbert published that, De Magneta. Um, uh, and um, so that hypothesis makes very specific uh, predictions about the direction and intensity of the field around the Earth. So let's just take a look at how that works. So for this is the 2005 field. The um, little the thing in the upper left is um, the Earth. The uh, core is yellow, the yellow circle in the middle, and the little blue lines are lines of flux which are reconstructed from the International Geomagnetic Reference Field for 2005. So we sample it around the Earth and uh, plot the, the dip of the field um, as a function of latitude. The red line is that predicted by, uh, by a geocentric axial dipole. 
um, or the little pretend magnet at the center of the Earth, and, um, and the dots are the measurements um, from the International Geomagnetic Reference Field, which is based on satellites and geomagnetic observatory data. Then Neil Updike, my advisor who just passed away, his, one of his most famous papers was in 1969, he did the same thing for deep sea sediment cores, measuring the dip of the field, uh, which would be averaged over some time, and then plotting that as a function of latitude, and he found, and the red line is the geocentric axial dipole hypothesis, and the data are the little black dots, and we can say, well, that's pretty good. And this holds up for the last five million years for the most part. Um, so what about the field strength, which is really the topic of the, of the talk today? Um, if you do the same thing for the field strength around the Earth, this is on the right-hand side, we see the um, field strength on the surface of the Earth, uh, and you can see the big blue belly and the, the, um, the two sp red spots in the bottom where the field is the strongest and the big red spots in the top uh, in the northern hemisphere where the field is the strongest. So this is not a dipole field, but you can see a dipole field would be an Easter egg with stripes parallel to latitude. But um, it's more interesting than that. And when you do the same kind of analysis of, of uh, picking data points around the surface of the Earth and plotting them as a function of latitude. The prediction is the red line and the observations for the present field are the black dots. And you can see that it's not as well fit by a dipole model. The southern hemisphere, because of this big blue, um, what's called the South Atlantic anomaly, um, is uh, it makes the, it, the field strengths are lower um, in the South Atlantic than they should be, and there's a lot more scatter, and so um, uh, so it's not as clean a picture. However, when you average it over time, one of the first, one of the very early database efforts in, uh, it was an IAGA-sponsored um, database uh, called the PINT, PINT, 95 database, uh, um, Tanaka in 1995 went through and averaged all the data for the last 10 million years and found this nice dipolar picture. So uh, people relaxed, optimism grew, and, um, and we were still in this optimistic phase of, of happy face. Um, <laughs> then I came along <laughs> and um, plotted the data for the last five million years um, uh, and others have done this uh, since. Um, and if you plot the field strength as a function of latitude over the last five million years, each one of these is an individual lava flow or uh, data point, cooling unit. And um, you can see <laughs> this, geez, this is the pessimism, right? That there's no dipole signal in there. I mean, I'd be nuts to try to convince you of that, right? I mean, you'd just be laughing. So let's just be honest. Um, there's no dipole signal in the database for the last five million years. And uh, what could go wrong? So you could be comparing, because we know that the field changes very quick, and, and, um, um, and this is not globally um, it's not a dipole field. There's a lot of non-dipole field in there. You could be comparing data from different ages, from different field states. You could be, there so could be something wrong with a dipole model, but you know, it's served us well for 400 years and I'm not willing to throw that away first. Um, there could be something wrong with the way we're doing the experiment or there could be something wrong with the way we're interpreting the data. Um, so, Let's just cut out the time aspect and just look at data from a single lava flow. This is uh, data from 1960 lava flow. There's a lot of paleomagnetic holes in this flow, but they've all been covered up with, oh boy, the, um, with the 2018 flow. So um, you can see that you, we get the range of the Earth's magnetic field, um, the entire 
range in one lava flow, and that cannot be, it, they must all have the same answer. I want to point out that the little red triangles over on the left are ours, so we're very, we were also then, we first looked at this and got pessimistic, and then we looked at our own data and said, geez, we know what we're doing, so we got optimistic again. But the general picture is, oh no. Um, so why are the data so bad? Is the physical theory, the, the one primary answer is that the physical theory for TRM only applies to these little dipoles. And anybody who knows anything about rocks knows that nothing's that simple. Most data in the database are fr not from rocks that conform to that hypothesis. So what happens if you have um, larger grains that are not uniaxial single domain, I mean uniformly magnetized? So on the upper left-hand corner, there's teeny weeny little ones that do conform, and we get this nice straight line, and we recover the field in the laboratory. However, as the, as the sample, as the magnetic minerals get larger and larger, your answer gets worse and worse, and it's terrible. So this curvature is, is obviously very harmful we're off by, uh, well, 42 as opposed to 60 is not a good enough answer. Um, so um, these data are for very large minerals. Most of the stuff that we work on are not that large. They're, there must be another source of this curvature, which to me looks like a bad thing. Um, and so um, we started, there isn't any explanation for curvature in smaller grains, there's no physical theory for it yet. Um, so we took a bunch of rocks, some that were well behaved, like in the upper left hand corner, and some that were poorly behaved, like in the lower left hand corner, and then gave them a fresh uh, magnetization in the lab, and to make a long story short, some of them we left in the field for now four years, um, and some we gave, uh, we did the experiments immediately. The ones over here on the left and the little red squares, uh, we were able to recover the laboratory field very well. Those were the ones that were straight, so conformed to the assumptions of the method. Very highly precise, um, accurate answer. We're optimistic. The ones that were curved got, uh, there's not a bias there, but there's, you need an awful lot of data and um, the, the scatter is enormous um, for these curved specimens, and so you can't assume that you have the right answer at all if you don't ha conform to the assumptions of the method. So, and it gets worse when you, when you age them, even over two years, very surprising result of, of the curvature increases over time. And so um, there's another source of curvature besides just this large crystal problem, um, which uh, we don't understand. Um, so um, I, my uh, Les Nudge, my postdoc, and colleague Wen Williams have been working on this kind of thing for a long time. So they've been working on magnetic modeling of crystals. Um, and on the upper left-hand corner, you see this, it's, it's a tiny crystal, it's about 60 nanometers, and you can see that the magnetization is not uniform, but pretty uniform, and they're very stable little crystals magnetically. Um, and, in the, and on the right-hand side, the surprise of this study was that the uh, larger crystals are um, actually highly stable. Um, and, uh, but, so if you had only crystals that are, say, 100, uh, 140 nanometers and larger, you'd be fine. Um, but there's this interval in between where, where the structure is evolving from what's called a flower uh, to uh, this vortex uh, on the right-hand side. And, um, and the, so things that are flower state are very good. Things that are this single vortex state are highly stable and will give you linear plots. Um, but uh, there's this interval in between which must be ubiqu ubiquitous in rocks um, and it's, uh, the magnetization is not aligned along the easy minimum <coughs> axis of, of, uh, of uh, energy, which was a complete surprise. It's aligned along the hard axis, and 
these guys, I'm calling the bad boys, because they're not going to be as stable. And I think they're the source. I cannot prove it yet, but I hope this year to be able to demonstrate this using the micromagnetic modeling, or I won't, but my, my students and postdocs and colleagues will. So, um, so here's our realism. We're, um, what we need now is a way to have objectively interpreting the data, including all the, the complications, and we need a test data set to verify that we're getting the right answer. So I'm gonna just zoom through this. Uh, my students working on a Bayesian estimation approach, which we're calling best, of course. <laughs> um, and uh, we get the right answer with, with uh, very reasonable uncertainties. I can't go into it because Edward is already pacing. And, um, and we apply it to a test data set where uh, we've collected data, the measurement data of a large number of studies um, and uh, that had the original measurement data so we could reanalyze those data um, and uh, see how well uh, the, we were doing with our method. So um, the horizontal dashed line is the expected field. These are historical lava flows, most of them, so we knew what the field was. Um, and um, the red dots were using our old analysis method, the one that gave the little triangles um, uh, that worked pretty well, but we lost a lot of things because we were very, very strict. Um, so now we believe that this new method will be, allow us to reanalyze data, get an accurate and, and reasonable uncertainties on it, um, and, and so we're now um, kind of in this optimistic, uh, well, real, I call it, the, now I feel like we're entering the realistic stage. So the curved, the curved plots are terrible, they're inaccurate, they're imprecise, and the straight ones seem to be good, but how do you know which is which if you don't have the original data or you don't have enough, uh, if you have enough specimens and you have the original data, you can get a right answer, a correct answer, um, but um, many experiments don't even test for linearity or uh, any of the underlying assumptions. So, where are we going? Um, uh, we're hunting for things that are in the flower state, and that means glassy materials, quenched materials. Um, most archaeological materials seem to, to well, many are, are fired pottery, for example, ceramics work very well for this. Um, and also in this easy aligned single vortex state, which means that uh, we're looking at single uh, crystal silicate hosted magnetic inclusions. I'm not, but my colleagues are. And we need more magnetic modeling um, more shapes and sizes, which we then can use to inter give us the physical theory that we so need. Um, and then um, we need more ground truthing, so we need the original data, we need uh, community lab standards would be really nice, and we need the original data to be in a f uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable database um, so that we can reanalyze the old data and also get people's um, filing cabinets typed up <laughs> by volunteers or um, uh, irritable graduate students <laughs> who get tired very quickly <laughs> um, to uh, get the original data into the database. Thank you. <laughs>